Okay. Hey there, everyone, and a big welcome to the VSX live stream hosted by Triple Platinum Engineer, Mr. Matt Weiss. Uh, we're super excited to see all your faces here today. Uh, now, before we jump into the main event, let's talk about how we're going to really work through today's event uh, for everyone that owns VSX. So Matt's taking us through different listening spaces and sending his dry outs through this live stream. So put your VSX headphones on, open up VSX system wide, and when Matt uses specific rooms in VSX, do the same thing in system wide. That way you'll hear exactly what Matt's hearing in real time. If you own VSX but haven't installed VSX system wide yet, uh, launch your Steven Slate Audio Center and install it from there. And for those of you who do not own VSX yet, you're in for a treat. You'll be able to hear Matt's main outs over this live stream, and you'll be hearing how the final mix takes shape as Matt makes adjustments based on what he's hearing in each VSX room. So you don't need VSX system wide, uh, so just sit back and watch the magic happen. Uh, also, we're recording this event so all of our friends around the world can see it. Uh, and we'll also email a link out in the next day or two. So if you miss anything from today, um, don't worry, you'll soon get a link to the complete video of today's session to watch at your own pace. And uh, a final quick word about our Q&A process today. Because we have so many folks joining us today, attendees audio are, are muted, but please uh, put any questions into the chat room. Uh, post And to post in the chat, all you need to do is give Vimeo your name. You don't need to sign up for a Vimeo account, just your name will do. Uh, and I'm going to be tracking them, and toward the end of the session, I'll start throwing them over to Matt, so be sure to stick around to hear his responses. Uh, and for our last bit, I have Sagar from Steven Say Audio also going to give us a little bit before we get into the, the live stream. Hey guys, we're so excited you could join us tonight. Uh, so just a quick word, if you don't already have VSX, now is a great time for you. The reason is because we're selling VSX Platinum for $100 off from now until the end of the year, until December 31st. You get the VSX headphones, you get every room we make, including every room Matt's going to show you tonight. It's our lowest price of the year. Just head over to stephenslateaudio.com and check it out. Perfect. So without any more waiting around, let's dive right in. Matt, we're super excited. Take it away. Hey, what's going on, everybody? So I'm really happy everybody's joining us. We had technical problems last time, but you're still rocking with me, and I, I really do appreciate that. So uh, as Carlos and Sagar said, the, if you have VSX, you're going to want to put that on, use system-wide, and the benefit to that is that you're going to be able to hear everything that I'm doing the same exact way that I'm doing it. Uh, so you'll hear exactly, sorry, you'll hear exactly the same thing that I'm hearing. Uh, if you don't have VSX, that's okay. You'll be able to hear what VSX is giving me that could potentially also be giving you and be able to compare it to your direct system that you're used to monitoring on. So I'll put on my VSX here and I'm going to pull up my program. So the first thing I want to talk about real quick is where I choose to start. Now, uh, Slate Audio did just put out a couple new emulations. I haven't really given them the chance that they deserve quite yet, but I do like them. For now, my typical starting place is going to be the Stephen Slate room, usually on the midfields. I find that this gives me a really nice, flat, even response. It's, it's a boring sound, but it's a boring sound in a good way because we want our monitors to not give us anything extra. I do sometimes start from the Archon midfields as well. However, I do that when I feel like I need to catch a vibe. They give me a little bit more energy and a little bit more bounce in the low end. And so if I need motivation, they're a great starting place, but if I need accuracy, Steven's Mix Room is what it is. So let's say you've got Steven's Mix Room up and let's get started. So I'm going to pull this out of the way and we're going to listen to this record from the top. The real secret to mixing actually happens in your brain, not in your ear, uh, certainly not in your eyes, but it happens in your brain. We have to listen to what the record is giving us and we have to formulate an idea of what it should ultimately sound like and compare that to what it already sounds like. So, let's play it down. Girl, I want to get me a high roller. You know, one of them rich. Me too. You know, he could be from there too. Fine. <laughs> you silly. Hey, my baby want to see me. Wanna see no, me. she really want to see Detroit. I'm the one on repeat. We're port in line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet. Better sit down on it on TP. More like Danny Green from the D League. Call me MJ, Kobe with a three P. Matter of fact, there are without an injury. Without an injury. Hey, exception be the energy. Hope people never give a f who you tryna be. Cause your head 
bigger down me, you ahead of me. Fuck. Couple patches on my letter, man. Put a K to your letter, man. Like you graduated Ketteran. On the yard, life behind balls. Story to real life. Now I'm ready. Time to share with this what broke feel like. Feel like. Feels like still a slave in the field. Now the rap nigga slay to a deal. Public house and can't afford bills. Few steps, time mama made meals. Well, we're going to stop it there. So it's definitely not the edited version quite yet. I'm going to be editing a couple little things uh, as we go because I did a very bad job creating a family-friendly version. Nice. Okay, but what is the aim of this record? What's the intention? So first of all, in terms of the vibe of the record, the emotion of the record, I would say it's a head nod record, right? It's got sort of a down-tempo sway to it. There's long bass note connections between the kick drum hits. All that kind of stuff tells me that it's kind of supposed to give you this sort of slower motion to it. In terms of the the energy of it, like the personality of it, I, I don't want it to be too pretty. It's got this kind of like slightly harsh sounding violin sample going on in the background. Um, it's got like these kind of grisly sounding kicks, 808s, drums, and just Reddick the rapper's delivery is already kind of a little guttural, a little gritty. Uh, I think that taking this kind of more in like like a hip hop hip hop direction as opposed to like a more pop friendly hip hop direction is probably going to be good. So these things are going to be in the back of my mind as I'm mixing and these ideas are really really important. The reason why I stress that we need to get an idea of where we want the record to go in our brains before we even start is because we're going to run into a lot of situations where we have trouble determining what we like. Sometimes we'll do something and it'll sound good. We'll do something completely different and it'll also sound good. So if we keep going back to the intention of the record and what we believe the record should sound like, that's going to allow us to pick out which version is going to be the better approach. So for this record, I could start from a number of places. I think the lead vocal with like a rap record and really pretty much any record is never a poor choice for a starting place. A lot, a lot of times I start there. This will probably be the case here. I think that also starting from the sample might not be a bad idea because it would give us kind of the general color of the record if we really lock that down. But in this particular case, I think I am going to start with the vocal. So to do that, I'm going to mute up the instrumental. I'm also going to mute up my background vocals, and I'm just going to focus on my lead here. Hey, my baby want to see me? No, she really want to see I'm the one on repeat. We'll put in line, Charlie Sheen on Sweet Sweet. Better sit down, I'm the on TP. So when I hear it without the rest of the record, I realize that there is a concentration of energy that I didn't notice before. There's a little bit more concentration of energy in the nose range and a little bit less concentration of energy in the body than what I first picked up on, which is a good thing in some ways. It means that the low end of the record is doing what it's supposed to do. But I think that I would rather have this vocal be really dominant, really present, really forward. Even if it felt like it was stepping a little in front of the record, I think that that would be okay. It's just meant to be really in your face. So to do that, what I want to do is evenly distribute the energy a little bit more. If I have too much energy up here in the nose range, I want to cut that back down and bring out some more of the energy in the body range. So let's let's find it. More light than a green from the D League. Call me MJ Kobe with a three P. Matter of fact, there was without an injury. Hey, perception be the energy. People never give who you trying to be. Yeah, so it's this stuff, this kind of 2K stuff that's a little bit too dominant. Uh, now, is it a resonance? No, I don't need to do a narrow cut. I want to do a broad, gentle cut because I'm contouring the overall tone of the vocal. So I'm just going to start pulling this down until it starts sounding a little bit too weak. More like Danny Green from the D League. Call me MJ, Kobe with a 3P. Matter of fact, there was without an injury. Hey, perception be the energy. People never give who you trying to be? Cause your head big down me and you ahead of me. Couple patches on my letter, man. Put a K to your letter, man. Like you graduated Ketteran. So that's not bad. There's maybe a little bit still hanging out kind of in like the center mid range around here. So maybe just like a dB less of that. And then I'm just going to adjust the output. I'm going to turn up the overall level by maybe a dB, dB and a half, something like that. And that's going to emphasize both this low range here and also a little bit of the brighter range as well. More like Danny Green from the D League. Call me MJ, Kobe with a 3P. Matter of fact, there was without an injury. Hey, perception be the energy. If you're just joining us, by the way, I am in the Steven Slate midfield mix room, in case you missed that at the very, very beginning. Um, thank you. Joel is uh, giving me a little... We got into the technical stuff and pulled it off, guys. 
<laughs> okay, so yes, so Stephen Slate uh, mix room, and for the most part, by the way, if you get lost on what room I'm in, most of the time, unless I'm talking about something specific, I will end up back here. This is my home base. I think that establishing kind of a home base with VSX is always a good idea. So, okay, so let's do that before and after, and you're going to hear that the vocal sounds way bigger immediately. More like Danny Green from the D-League. Call me MJ, Kobe with a 3 P. Matter of fact, there was without an injury. More like Danny Green from the D-League. Call me MJ, Kobe with a 3 P. Matter of fact, there was without an injury. It sounds like the vocal just became way bigger, but if we were to actually look at it on a peak meter or something like that, it would probably be approximately the same or somewhere similar because it's just a different curve overall. Following this idea ultimately is going to give us a bigger mix overall with less need for compression at the end. So if you've ever wondered how do you get your mixes to be commercially loud, it's this thought process that helps get you there. Now the other thing that I'm going to say about this vocal is that dynamically it's pretty good. I don't, I think it might have been tracked with some compression. Visually it looks like it was tracked with some compression, but it might also just be Redick having, you know, a really good delivery. I would say controlling it a little bit more is going to be really helpful, but this is something that I think people tend to frequently get maybe not so correct. Compression is not the solution to big sound. Compression can actually really get in the way of big sound. Controlling a vocal but retaining a sense of dynamic is going to be much more beneficial to getting a big sound. So how are we going to do that? Well, first of all, which one of these am I going to select? I have three different emulations on an 1170. I mean, why am I even taking an 1176 out of all the compressors that I could have? Well, it's because I want to control faster peaks. It's going to be a fast compressor that still has a bit of softness to the knee. And so that makes it really good for controlling fast peaks. Now, within this emulation, what am I going to choose? F, D, or A? F is the brightest and cleanest, D is in the middle, A is kind of the grittiest and darkest, and because of the way I think we should be voicing this record, gritty and dark is probably going to be the way to go. I'm gonna keep the four to one ratio, I don't wanna over compress this vocal, and I'm going to start setting the attack and release. Now, for whatever reason, on this emulation, the attack and release are backwards. So before you jump in the comments and start flaming me about how I'm turning this the wrong way, just know that the normal 10 and 2 setting we oftentimes use in vocals is actually 2 and 10 on this one. I don't know why. Uh, but yeah, we're going we're gonna to rock with it. So this is always a very good starting place. It's tried and true classic, but it's just a starting place. We're going to adjust things as we go. We're putting line, Charlie Sheen on Sweet Sweet. Better sit down. I'm the sh on TP. More like Danny Green from the D-League. Call me MJ. Kobe with a 3P. Matter of fact, there was without an injury. Hey, perception be the energy. People never give who you trying to be? Cause your head big down, man. You ahead of me. Couple patches on my letter, man. Put a K to your letter, man. Like you graduated Ketteran on the yard. So when I'm setting the compressor, I usually want to push it into the point where I start to actually hear the compressor itself. Like the compressor becomes a personality on the voice. And uh, as soon as I hear that, typically I back off, unless I'm going for a specific effect. If I'm going for like a heavy compression, kind of like lock of vocal, dead in place type of thing, like early Drake records, you hear that a lot, then it's a little different. But for most vocals, including rap vocals, once I start to really hear the compressor working, that's where I stop and back it off a hair. So, okay, let's, uh, let's also check our attack and release times. We're putting a lot Charlie Sheen on Sweet Sweet, better sit down, I'm the on TP, more like Danny Green from the D-League, call me MJ. I think just slowing it down a little bit on the attack is pretty good. Uh, usually we want pretty punchy vocals for rap uh, just because of the progressive nature of the delivery. Uh, sometimes going faster on the release can be good as well to give more body and forwardness. We're putting line, Charlie Sheen on Sweet Sweet, better sit down, I'm the on TP, more like Danny Green from the D-League. And then there's one other interesting control over here, which is this harmonics control. And this is why I really do like this particular emulation quite a bit. If I want, I can make this pretty fuzzy. We're we'll putting line, Charlie Sheen on Sweet Sweet, better sit down, I'm the on TP, more like Danny Green from the D-League. Now, typically I tend to go in the opposite direction. I usually prefer my leads to be cleaner. We're we'll putting line, Charlie Sheen on Sweet Sweet, better sit down, I'm the on TP. But in this case, remember, we sort of mentioned like going a little gritty might actually be really good for this vocal. So instead of going for the normal default, pushing it a little bit into distortion might be really good. We're we'll putting line, Charlie Sheen on Sweet Sweet, better sit down. I'm the 
on TP. More like Danny Green from the D League. Call me MJ Kobe with a three P. Yeah, just that little hair of fuzz that we can detect in Solo that we're really just going to kind of hear as like an energy or a color. It's too subtle to really pick up as like, oh, it's distorted. That's going to be a really nice sound for this. And then it also seemed to lower the output, I guess, because it's doing something dynamically as well. So a little hair extra output. A little quick before and after. We'll put in line, Charlie Sheen on Sweet Sweet. Better sit down. I'm the sh on TP. More like Danny Green from the D League. We'll put in line, Charlie Sheen on Sweet Sweet. Better sit down. I'm the sh on TP. More like Danny Green from. So it's a little husky. It's a little crunchy. We've got a, some good stuff going on. It might sound like it's a little bit processed in solo, but. Just from experience, I know that once we pull in the rest of the record, it's probably going to sound a lot more natural than it did just now. But if it doesn't, we change things. Anytime we start setting things up in solo, it's just so that we can get a really good idea of what we're hearing. What's going to really make the difference, though, is how we hear it relative to everything else. My baby want to see me? No, she really want to see me. I'm the one on repeat. We're part in line, Charlie Sheen on Sweet Sweet. Better sit down, I'm the on TP. More like Danny Green from the D League. Okay, I'm liking this direction. It actually feels a little more compressed than I expected it would, but I'm gonna give you the before and after real quick. My baby wanna see me? No, she really wanna see me. I'm the one on repeat. We're part in line, Charlie Sheen on Sweet Sweet. Better sit down, I'm the sh on TP. More like Danny Green from the D League. Call me MJ, Kobe with a 3P. Okay, I'm gonna take this distortion down one little tick, and I'm going to slow my attack down a little, back off this compressor a little, and slow down my release a little. And I think that's gonna give me what's probably gonna be the best sound. I'm the one on repeat. We're part in line, Charlie Sheen on Sweet Sweet. Better sit down, I'm the on TP. More like Danny Green from the D League. Call me MJ, Kobe with a 3P. Matter of fact, there are roles without an injury. Hey, exception be the energy. People never give a Who you trying to be? Cause your head big and down me, you ahead of me. Yeah, I think I just want a little bit more level out of the vocal overall. So let's do that. Let's give it one more tick here. I'm the one on repeat. We're part in line, Charlie Sheen on Sweet Sweet. Better sit down, I'm the on TP. More like Danny Green from the D League. Yeah, nice. So uh, with the level for the vocal, I want it so that the low end of the vocal feels like it's going to stretch into the kick drum. And then managing where the kick drum sits and the 808 sits is going to create like this really perfect kind of blend between the vocal going into the low end of the vocal, going into the kick drum, going into the bass. And that's going to give a really full body vocal effect, which is what I think is going to be really good for this record. So now that I have a basic sound for my vocal, now I can start moving on to some of the other elements. I think that getting... I could go to the kick, I could go to the sample. Um, I think I'm going to go to the kick, which is actually probably... I don't know. I'm mixed, mixed feelings on that, but it's okay. Let's go to the kick in the 808. Hey, my baby want to see me? No, she really want to see... I'm the one on repeat. We're part in line, Charlie Sheen on Sweet Sweet. Better sit. So the low end feels a little bit thin right now. What I want to do is I just want to hop on over to the far fields. So pull up your VSX and switch on over to far field. And what I'm going to do is mute the vocal for a split second. And I'm just going to hear how the low end sounds quality wise. Not necessarily quantity wise, but just quality wise on the bigger speakers. So again, we're on the Slate Room Far Fields now. And yeah, on these Far Fields, it's kind of confirming what I was hearing on the midfields. They're not really giving that sub impact that I'm looking for, particularly the kick. So I think I need to negotiate between the kick and the 808 a little bit more. These should be pretty heavy handed feeling on bigger speakers like this. Like, just with the 808, there's like a very, very, very low tone, but it's so low, it's almost out of the range of human hearing, and that's not really doing us any favors. So now, listening to the kick... I hear bass tone a little bit better, I hear subtone a little bit better when it's literally just the kick and nothing else. I also hear a lot of that knocky tone, which I think is a good thing. Uh, so I can definitely keep that going. One thing I want to try before I try anything else 
is just taking a utility plugin, so Trim in Pro Tools, uh, Utility and Logic or whatever else you might be using, and I'm just going to switch the polarity on the kick. Sometimes this has a really interesting effect on how the sub gets perceived. It's really interesting, right? Um, I think I prefer it without it flipped, but there was a little bit more sub that kind of came out of things when I did that. Um, the first thing I want to do is just turn the 808 up a little bit. Notice that I'm going for the simplest solutions, by the way. If I want to hear more weight from the low end, maybe just turning the 808 up a little bit more is going to be best. Yeah, crackle-wise, crunch-wise, that's probably about in the right place. I think I'm also going to want to boost some sub. Hey, my baby want to see me? No, she really want to see... I'm the one on repeat. Report in line, Charlie Sheen on Sweet Sweet, better sit down. So, okay, next step, I think I'm just going to want to boost some sub on the 808. That, like, deep, 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 deep stuff. So the way I like to do that is I like to grab an EQ that I like and set the frequency super low, so here 25 hertz, and use a shelf. Now, I'm not actually really trying to pull up 25 hertz, I'm trying to broadly pull up all of the sub range. Hey, my baby wanna see me? No, she really wanna see I'm the one on repeat, report in line, Charlie Sheen on Sweet Sweet, better sit down, I'm the on TP. Yeah, that's a really good physical hit from the 808. Hey, my baby wanna see me? No, she really wanna see I'm the one on repeat. Whoop. Yeah. Once I can start to like physically feel it vibrate, that's where I tend to like it. Now, with the kick, there's a couple things that we can do. It feels like it's a little light in the sub. There's nothing wrong, and this is something where I feel like the internet gets it wrong. We don't really say internets anymore. God, I'm showing my age. The internet tends to get this wrong. They say that, okay, if you're boosting subs in an 808, then you should be not boosting subs in the kick, or maybe even cutting subs in the kick. Sometimes that's true, and I'm going to show you a technique where that works, but sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes if your kick isn't subby enough and your 808 isn't subby enough, you boost sub in both. There's no law against that. It's, if it feels good, it's good. However, I'll show you a different technique real quick. Sometimes it's better for the way a kick and 808 relationship works to put the kick in the more audible range, like the physical audible range, which is between about maybe 80 hertz at the lowest, but like, you know, 100 hertz to 200 hertz range. And we could do that by kind of taking that same corner frequency and rolling off a little bit of sub here. Hey, my baby want to see me? No, she really want to see And then boosting the output to compensate. Kind of what we did with taking the nasalness down in the vocal, but now working in a different range. Hey, my baby want to see me? No, she really want to see... I'm the one on repeat. And you can hear how that makes the kick sort of sit on top of the 808 and make this very, very tall low end. It's a useful technique. I'm not sure it's really giving me what I like here. I would rather, I think, just make the 808 and the kick both hit a little bit harder. So I'm going to use a narrower bell in my low end. Like, not a narrow, narrow bell, but like a medium bell. And just see if I can find a sweet spot on the kick. Hey, my baby want to see me? No, she really... Yeah, so like 45 to 50 hertz-ish area seems to really resonate pretty well. Just a couple dB on that might be enough, especially if I take this level down real quick. Hey, my baby want to see me? No, she really want to see... I'm the one on repeat. Report in line, Charlie Sheen on Sweet Sweet, better sit down. Actually, like this 56 hertz thing. It sounds pretty nice. Uh, now, a second check for the low end. And this is one of the things I really, really, really love about VSX is this grungy, dirty club room because how it sounds in a club, how the low end specifically sounds in a club is really, really important. Uh, by the way, I'm going to make a mention here of something. This depth knob will interplay a little differently between different spaces. So I prefer to, when I'm using Steven's room, I prefer to have the depth knob a little bit lower 
when I'm going to something like the club room, I really want to hear how it interacts in a room type of space. And I find that about nine or three o'clock. Yeah. About three o'clock is a good place for me on this. So you can adjust that or you cannot adjust that. It's up to you, but you know, this is how I like to hear it on this room. Hey, my baby want to see me? No, she really want to see I'm the one on repeat. Reporting line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet, better sit down. I'm the on TP, more like Danny Green from the D-League. Call me MJ, Kobe, what a three. The main thing I'm listening for here is whether or not the notes feel like they're too long in the low end. In this particular case, there's a fair amount of space in the low end. The kicks are hitting with, you know, a good amount of separation timing wise. And then the 808 is kind of sustaining between them. So it's working out pretty nicely. And just knowing that this is working is an important test. If you, if you're doing something where there's fast low end in particular, like, uh, like, like metal music with like blast drums and stuff like that, this is a really important test because it's very very easy for kick notes to get too long on these types of playbacks. So I'm going to jump back over to Steven's mix room here. We're going to go back to the midfields. We're back to home base now. All right. So here we are back in Steven's room. Okay. My baby want to see me? No, she really want to see I'm the one on repeat. Reporting line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet, better sit down. I'm the on TP, more like Danny Green from the D League. Call me MJ, Kobe, what a three P. That's sounding pretty good to me. I mean, it still has a little bit, the vocal still has a little bit of push in the mids. I don't know if I'm necessarily mad at that, to be honest. I could do something like put a second EQ on now that I, I have a better idea of how the low end is going to sound and do like a very broad, kind of just mild cut like this and then do a little bit of makeup gain. And that might make the vocal feel fuller. Reporting line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet, better sit down. I'm the on TP, more like Danny Green from the D League. Call me MJ, Kobe, what a three P. Matter of fact, there rose without an injury. Hey, perception be the energy. Yeah, so that's a slightly smoother take, but this is going to be one of those places where I'm going to deviate from what sounds better, quote unquote, to what feels a little better. I think I like that mid range in his voice a little bit better, even if it makes things feel a little out of balance and a little out of whack. And this is one of those places where, like, I've been, I've been following that philosophy for a long time, and it shows up in all of my mixes. You'll hear all sorts of sonic weird stuff in my mixes, but if you just kind of turn off your thinking brain, hopefully if I've done my job right, it, you just feel the mix, you just feel the energy, and you don't worry about whether or not it sounds good, because that's what the end listener is going to be doing, ultimately. Okay, let's get some of our mid stuff going on. I think it's time to bring in these samples. It might have been time to bring in the sample a little bit beforehand. My baby wanna see me? No, she really wanna see I'm the one on repeat. Reporting line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet, better sit down. I'm the on TP. More like Danny Green from the D League. Call me MJ, Kobe with a three P. Matter of fact, there rose without an injury. So this is a really interesting example of um, where our sonics and our emotional vibe type of brains might come into conflict. So this, technically speaking, there's not a lot here that's happening. There's, there's the sample, which is kind of thin, and then we've got our kick and low end, and there's really no other element that's going to provide a natural sense of low mid and, and upper bass outside of maybe the vocal. So we have a couple of options here. We can either go into our 808 and hit that low mid range, so something maybe around 200 hertz, and just like start pumping that up. My baby wanna see me? No, she really wanna see I'm the one on repeat. Reporting line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet, better sit down. I'm the on TP, more like. And that sounds really good. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is going to be to get that low mid energy from our sample because it's the only other thing that potentially could have it. So we take that up, same kind of range. My baby wanna see me? No, she really wanna see the one on repeat reporting line charlie sheen on sweet sweet better sit down i'm the on tp more like danny green from the and here we don't want to use our thinking brains to make this determination thinking brain this is a smoother connection but feeling brain there's something sleepy happening so i want to be wary about boosting low mids in this sample i think the better choice is to get some of our low mid out of the 808 it might make things a little messier, it might make things a little grungier, but I think it's gonna give us a better energy. My baby wanna see me? No, she really wanna see I'm 
the one on repeat. Reporting live, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet, better sit down. I'm the on TP. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't also get some energy out of the sample. There's nothing wrong with, you know, going in here, grabbing like 300 hertz, 400 hertz, and giving it a couple dB extra just to kind of give it a little body. It's Masking and separation, those ideas are only problematic when they're actually problematic. If I boost so much low end into the sample that it starts to become a muddy mess, I've gone too far. And if it started that way, then yes, I would be needing to cut some of this low energy. But because it doesn't have a lot of that low energy, I can probably get away with boosting a little bit. Same idea as kind of what was happening with the kick in the bass, or kick in the 808. My baby wanna see me? No, she really wanna see I'm the one on repeat, reporting live, Charlie Sheen on sweet. Yeah, notice with a, a little boost here, it still doesn't really sound particularly heavy. But what I do notice is there's this plucked kind of like, uh, I'm not sure what the instrument is. It's, a, it's a, some kind of a harp-like lyre type of instrument that's tucked in with the violin. And it's really thin without that boost. I really like that element though, so I think that finding a sweet spot that brings out that specific element might actually enhance the song, not just in terms of frequency balance, which frankly, the end listener only cares about so much and they only care about subconsciously, but the musicality of it might actually improve because that particular element, which is hiding behind the violin, might step forward and present a better musical vibe for the record. Yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff that's happening around 300 hertz. So let's narrow this up just a hair. I don't want to go overly into the lows and make something too muddy. And, you know, I was exaggerating this quite a bit. So let's back this off just a hair and see. Let's just let's see how 6 dB feels. 6 dB is a nice starting point. My baby want to see me? No, she really want to see me. I'm the one on repeat. Reporting live, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet, better sit down. I'm the on TP, more like Danny Green from the D League. Call me MJ, Kobe with a three P. Matter of fact, there was without an injury. Hey, yeah, especially on that turnaround, that little pluck thing sounds really good. Matter of fact, there was without an injury. Hey, nice. Uh, I'm into it. The other thing I might say is that I wouldn't be mad if there was some grit in this. Now, grit can come from a few places. There might be some noise that we can boost just by like grabbing super top end and seeing what happens. Uh, it kind of makes those guitars a little stringy. It's actually not terrible to have a little bit of articulation on those guitars, but I think if we really want some grit in there, we're gonna need to manufacture it. So I'm gonna grab, mm, I could use retro color. There's also a really nice, little program here called Cassette. I think this is, I want to say Waves Factory. Yeah, Waves Factory. So this can be a really, really good way to get like a sample sound that has a little bit more grossness in it. So let's add input, take out the output. Ooh, I like this micro one. It's kind of gross. It's kind of gross and disgusting. And that's exactly what I want. As a, as a philosophical point, um, one of the things I really like to pay attention to is whenever I do something and I think to myself, that sounds weird, but I like it, I almost always want to keep those things. Like, I have to pause and mentally just go, uh, maybe that's a good thing. Let's roll with it. So, okay, let's pull the sample back in and just make sure that it fits. No, she really want to see. I'm the one on repeat. 
TP. Reporting line, Charlie Sheen on sweet speak. Better sit down, I'm the on TP. More like Danny Green from the D League. Call me MJ, Kobe with a three P. Matter of fact, there rose without an injury. Hey, perception be the enemy. Let's see. Can I refresh my control room feed? Allow. Okay. I have refreshed my control room feed. I'm getting I'm getting feed from uh, from the team here. All right, let's let's keep working on this sound design here. No, she really wanna see. I'm the one on repeat. Reporting line, Charlie Sheen on sweet sweet. Better sit down. I'm the on TP. More like Danny Green from the D League. Call me MJ. Kobe with a three P. Matter of fact, I mean it's pretty good. I'm gonna turn up the intermodulation a little bit. No, she really wanna see. I'm the one on repeat. Reporting line, Charlie Sheen on sweet sweet. Better sit down. I'm the on TP. More like Danny Green from the D League. Call me MJ. Kobe with a three P. Matter of fact, there rose without it. You know. As much as I do like this, I gotta say, we need the articulation of the top end a little bit in order for some of those other musical elements to get in the way. So this brings up a second philosophical point, which is, as much as you might fall in love with your own ideas, you have to be really well, really ready, willing, and able to let them go. It's a very, very important part. No, she really wanna see I'm the one on repeat. Reporting line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet, better sit down, I'm the on TP. I like that. I, I wanna try one other thing. I'm going to pull up Decapitator. Um, just because I used one distortion doesn't mean I can't use two. There's no law against doing this. Uh, typically speaking, I tend to gravitate toward the T or P settings for like color and sound design type of effects. Uh, but let's, let's roll with this here. So I'm going to get this very, very grungy sound here. I'm going to really push the drive. Yeah, that's pretty awful. I think I'm going to put it before the cassette. And lean it dark. And then use this mix knob just so I have a little bit of that extra grit in there. And by the way, just as a reminder, we're still on our home base here. I'm still on the Steven Slate midfields. So most of the core mix stuff that I'm going to be doing, again, we're on the Steven Slate, uh, Steven's Mix Room midfields. That's my home base here. Although we are going to switch in a minute. Yeah, so that little bit of extra grain right there. Perfect. My baby want to see me? No, she really want to see me. I'm the one on repeat. All right, let's get the snare in here. My baby wanna see me? No, she really wanna see. Me. I'm the one on repeat. Reporting line, Charlie Sheen on sweet sweet. Is that really the only snare? I could have sworn there was like a snare snare somewhere. No, she really wanna see. Me. I'm the one on repeat. Reporting line, Charlie Sheen on sweet sweet. Better sit down. I'm the. Okay, yeah. So we have this kind of more like clap type of thing, and then we've got this kind of wood stick kind of thing. So let's solo those up real quick, just so that we can hear them. Uh, there we go, and let's go. My baby want to see. Okay, so this is a good time to maybe try switching over to something like NS tens. I I think I would probably continue to stick around in this room. Maybe if I was just kind of going and flowing, but if I switch over to NS tens, so either the energy room or, uh, Mike Dean studio near fields, um, I'm going to go with the energy room. This is going to allow me to get the balance of these claps and snares. Correct. It's very easy for this sound to be kind of like too bright. My baby want to see me. Yeah. One of the things with NS tens is like, if something is harsh, you're going to notice on NS10s. So having this at my disposal going to be really helpful for these kinds of sounds where there's a lot of like crunchy, crusty, bright stuff. So that to me does not sound right. It sounds like it's too mid forward, too bright, doesn't have enough of that like roundness, that like wood kind of sound that you would kind of get around like maybe 700, 800 hertz. So I'm going to do just a big old boost right here. Yeah, maybe even a little more. I want these to sound round on the NS10, like have body and roundness, like not necessarily in a way where they lose their edge, 
but in a way where it feels like a well-represented sound. And th this is a very, very, very useful case for NS10s. Yeah, and just that one boost when the two drums are layered together makes a pretty significant difference. My baby wanna see me? No, she really wanna see me. I'm the one on repeat. We're pulling line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet. Better sit down, I'm the on TP. More like Danny Green from the D League. Call me MJ, Kobe with a three P. By the way, notice that on these NS10s, the vocal is not super loud. It's it's forward, but it's not super crazy forward. So this also might be another interesting case where the NS10s are telling me something a little bit that Steven's mix room wasn't originally telling me. So I might even turn the vocal up like one more hair just so that they sound forward on the NS10s. And that's because I know NS10s. I've used them more times than I could possibly begin to cat count. My baby want to see me? No, she really want to see me. Yeah, that half dB difference really made a big difference. And this is the beauty of having like a million different spaces that you can listen on. This is, it's like when I'm listening on my regular speakers, I have two sets of speakers. I have one set of main speakers and one set of references and that's it. But when I'm using VSX, I get like almost a million different speakers, uh, technically speaking, but I'm not that good at math. Uh, you get so much change in perception that you can start to get these very, very fine adjustments. Like a half dB adjustment on most speakers is going to be fairly unnoticeable, but because I've switched over to a new perspective, I'm noticing it. It's subtle, it's small, but it counts. Okay, so with all that said, I'm going to pop back on over to Steven's mix room here, and I'm going to go back to my home base, and I'm just going to get the rest of the elements in here. My baby want to see me? No. She really want to see me. I'm the one on repeat. Report in line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet. Better sit down, I'm the sh She really want to see me. I'm the one on repeat. Report in line, Charlie Sheen. She really want to see me. I'm the one on repeat. Yeah, let's turn this up. So, the cassette, I think, is a little noisy. A little, little too much hiss. Let's get the, uh... Let's get the... Where is my thing? Noise auto mute is on, that's good. Okay, let's just turn this down. Oh, she really wanna see I'm the one on repeat. Reporting live, Charlie Sheen. Okay, so with a peripheral element like this, this is a good element to use for creating a soundscape, something that spreads out a little bit more. So I'm gonna throw this over to the right. She really wanna see I'm the one on repeat. Reporting live, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet. And I'm going to pull in this other one. All right, this is kind of like a gritty little layer on top. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to throw it to the same place. And maybe even take this out all the way to the right. So it spreads in an interesting way. So I've got my gritty layer turned all the way right. And I've got my musical layer, the, the main layer, turned partially right. Baby wanna see me? No, she really wanna see me. I'm the one on repeat. Reporting live, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet. Down on the sh on TP. More like Danny Green from the D League. Call me MJ, Kobe with a three P. Matter of fact, there rose without an injury. Hey, perception be the energy. People never give a f who you trying to be, cause your head big down me, you ahead of me. Okay. Get our uh, let's just focus on this one area here, right? because I do want to make sure that there's time for questions and everything like that. Um, so I'm going to say this is going to be the main, let's say that this is what we're really mainly focusing on. The next step is to start looking around at translation. Like if I'm happy with this, which I'm not quite happy with it, but I'm pretty close. Hey, my baby. No, she really want to see. I'm the one on repeat. Reporting live, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet. Better sit down on this on TP. More like Danny Green from the D League. Hey, my baby wanna see me? No, she really wanna see me. I'm the one on repeat. Yeah, I kinda like that. Let's uh just give him that sense of space. Oh, that's interesting. Wanna see Um, let's keep that center. Wanna see And let's get this off to the left, this other little kind of fill thing. But in line, Charlie Sheen, no sweet Oh, I see it pans. Interesting. Oh, that's so cool. 
All right, we're just gonna turn that way up. More than line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet, better sit down. I'm the sh on TP. More like Danny Green from the D League. Call me MJ, Kobe with a three P. Matter of fact, there are without an injury. Yeah, I like that. Okay, uh, hats are pretty, pretty darn good. So we're gonna leave them at th there for now. So once I've got a balance that I really like on Steven's mix room, which here even explaining things, at least for just the verse, I've got something I'm pretty happy with over the course of about maybe 40 minutes. So not too long and probably a little bit faster actually if I was just concentrating, doing my thing, blah, 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 blah. Now we start looking at translation and this is really like, you know, I've, I've got a very expensive setup in my home studio. It's, and, you know, Room EQ consulted with a professional acoustician to get everything right and all that kind of stuff, put a lot of time into it. The one thing that does not change is the need for translation, no matter what. The car test never dies, even in a high-end setup. But now, I don't have to go to the car. <laughs> I can just go to the, the car settings. So, okay, where do we want to start with all of this? So, the first thing I'm going to do is pop on over to the SUV. This is, like, the original SUV model. It's definitely not the most hi-fi of the setups, but I think it's really well representative of what most car systems sound like. And I find that I, I'm not very rich. I drive a Nissan, and uh, this sounds pretty good and translates. This translation, I find, actually specifically I want to happen after we just give it a quick playback my baby want to see me no she really want to see me. I'm the one on repeat report in line Charlie Sheen on sweet sweet better sit down I'm the sh on TP more like Danny Green from the D League call me MJ Kobe with a 3P matter of fact there arose without an injury so when I'm listening in a car, there's a few things that can happen. Uh, first, there's a very specific connection between the primary mids and the lows that can feel very, very disconnected in a car. So one of the things I'm always checking for in the car is to make sure that that connection is still there. So remember when we boosted up the low mids on the 808 here? Uh, I feel like we need more of that because it's starting to disappear in the car. Similarly, we might need to go back over to the sample and we might need just a little bit more love on the low end of the sample. My baby want to see me? No, she really want to see me. I'm the one on repeat. Report in line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet, better sit down. I'm the on TP. More like Danny Green from the D League. Call me MJ, Kobe with a 3P. Matter of fact, there are without My baby want to see me? No, she really want to see me. I'm the one on repeat. Report in line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, so just a subtle move to kind of help glue that mid-range, like that 1K mid-range, down into the base and not let that get lost in the car. The other thing I'm also frequently listening to is the top end and the imaging. The imaging will tend to contract in the car. I don't want it to over-contract. Obviously, I don't want it to be crazy wide. That's probably not going to work too well because it's a tight space. Uh, and also the definition on the very brightest elements. Everything feels a little bit dull to me in this car setup. I'm going to hop on over from the regular SUV over to the electric car. If the electric car sounds kind of neutral, that means that we're probably too dark overall. Hey, my baby want to see me? No, she really want to see me. I'm the one on repeat. Report in line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet, better sit down. I'm the on TP. Yeah, so it, it feels a little overly dark here as well. It, it's, it's like balanced here, but that's definitely not the right sign. So what I'm going to do here is hop back on over to the SUV, and I'm going to brighten this up to the point where it's acceptable. So that's really, really important. I don't want it to sound bright in the SUV. If it sounds bright in the SUV, it's going to sound bright, like way too bright everywhere. But if it sounds just bright enough in the SUV, it's going to translate really, really well. Hey, my baby want to see me? No. She really want to see me. I'm the one on repeat. And in terms of where that brightness comes from, I think I'm actually going to do that on the submix. Uh, I think everything can just brighten up a hair. There's no law against putting an EQ on your mix bus. Please, I don't know where this came from. So I'm going to do just like a dB of air, maybe a dB and a half. Hey, my baby want to see me? No, she really want to see me. On repeat, report in line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet, better sit down, I'm the sh on TP, more like Danny Green from the D League, call me MJ, Kobe with a 3P. Yeah, so just that like 1DB, it sounds, it, it, it sounds like so little, but it actually really does make a difference, just even one little hair on, on the mix bus, so feeling good about that, oh my gosh, there we go. The next thing I want to check is the cell phone. 
So the cell phone is, it's a little disappointing that so many people listen to records on cell phones, but in reality, that is where we typically tend to first hear a lot of songs. Sometimes we're just walking around and we want to play it on our phone real quick. A lot of people's first experience of a song is going to be on that cell phone. So really important to check that translation. My baby want to see me? No, she really want to see me. I'm the one on repeat, reporting line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet, better sit down, I'm the sh on TP, more like Danny Green from the D-League, call me MJ, Kobe with a 3 P. matter of fact, there are rose without an injury, Hey. So there's a couple things that I'm really noticing right away on the cell phone, that uh, certain, certain things that I think are really good, and certain things that can be addressed. Uh, the 808, I can hear it on the cell phone, that's because of everything that we actually did in the SUV, right, that glue. It turns out it translates really well over to the cell phone because it's the same frequencies that get represented in that sense. So when I boosted up those low mids, boom, worked better on the cell phone. I don't need to worry about the lows on the cell phone, which is nice because usually I do. On the flip side of things, the 4K range on the hats, it didn't bother me in other spaces. I just sort of said it was. it's kind of like a characteristic of the hat, but here it's bothering me a little. So I do think I'm going to ease off a little bit of that kind of clunky stuff that's happening. I don't know if it's 2K, 4K, 3K, where exactly it is, but... Yeah, just easing off a little bit. Hey, my baby want to see me? No, she really want to see me. I'm the one on repeat, reporting line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet, better sit down, I'm the on TP, more like Danny Green from the D-League. And that sounds pretty good. Now, remember with the vocal, we kept things a little mid-rangey. This is where I may or may not reassess that. So I don't want to reassess it on the phone. I don't want the cell phone to be the be-all, end-all of what I decide. Instead, I'm going to hop on over to the club now that I've got the whole body of the verse in, and I want to hear it in, in terms of what's it going to sound like if it plays out live in a club. Is the vocal going to feel stridently mid-range, or is it going to sound okay? My baby want to see me? No, she really want to see me. I'm the one on repeat. Reporting line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet, better sit down. I'm the on TP. So, first of all, it sounds really good in the club, right? It doesn't sound overly roomy, which is really important. Uh, I do think tone-wise, I wouldn't mind if this came a little forward, just a hair, around like the 500 hertz range where that center body of the vocal is. Let's just see how that feels. My baby wanna see me? No, she really wanna see me. I'm the one on repeat. Reporting line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet, better sit down. I'm the sh on TP. More like Danny Green from the D League. Call me MJ, Kobe with a 3P. Matter of fact. Uh, I would say because I'm boosting into compression, I'm not really getting exactly the result I want. So let's try it when I'm not. My baby wanna see me? No, she really wanna see me. The one on repeat, reporting line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet, better sit down, I'm the sh on TP. Yep, that sounds pretty good. Uh, vocal is definitely really loud, but I think that that's fine. Um, otherwise, yeah, the record sounds really good in the club. Um, I don't know if I would necessarily put reverb on this vocal or not. I think that's more of an aesthetic choice than necessarily a necessary choice, and I kind of want to wrap up so that I can get to questions. Uh, but... I do want to say before we do that, that one last check on one more proper listening room is never a bad idea, and this is maybe where Howie's room, which finally, <laughs> I didn't like the sound of this room, I'm going to be honest, for a long time, but I'm finally starting to like it. So just as like a dummy check on like, what does it sound on a proper system here? My baby want to see me? No, she really want to see me. I'm the one on repeat, reporting line, Charlie Sheen on sweet, sweet, better sit down, I'm the sh on TP, more like Danny Green from the D-League, call me MJ, Kobe with a 3P, matter of fact, there are rose without an injury, Hey, exception be the energy. Sounds really good. So now what we've done here is we've got the main body of our mix in the Steven Slate room. And then we checked, after we got our main room sound down, then we kind of flipped a little bit to some other things just to kind of check certain sounds, you know, snares on the energy, uh, uh, NS10s. 
and stuff like that. So, you know, not completely sticking to one room, but basically having one room and then checking the translation rooms at the very end. Once I'm happy with how it sounds in all those spaces, I know that if I send this to a client, they're going to be happy. So I would consider this like the first pass sort of stage. And then I would send it to the client and we would discuss any kind of revisions, artistic directions, anything like that, live with the record, you know, make smaller changes if needed. Um, with all that said, I think I'd like to wrap up here. I'm going to throw this back on over to Carlos. Give me a second. Uh, OBS. And uh, mute my mic for a split second. All right. So, uh, yeah, Carlos, uh, take it away. And no problem, Matt. We really appreciate your time, a wealth of knowledge. Uh, I have a couple questions I compiled from the audience uh, that came in, and I just want to go through a couple of them. The first question we really have for you, Matt, is can you talk about your main go-to VSX rooms and what you listen for in each of those rooms? Yeah, okay. Um, so my my main room, as, as we've seen through this, is Steven's mix room. Uh, Yellow Matter just came out and I really like it, so I might change rooms. I've changed rooms before. Um, I like that one because to me it gives me the most neutral picture of the sound and for my brain and the way I like to work, that is going to get me the best results. However, there are different rooms that give us different bits of information. So we briefly jumped over to the NS10s that were in the energy room. That's really good for checking elements that can get harsh because it will reveal that harshness. Uh, similarly, if I want to really like get a sense of what the club would give me, but I want a really detailed sense of what the club gives me. The Mike Dean room, the Farfields, they give me that really, really big booming low end, but they give me detail. So I can fine tune what's happening in the low end if I'm having trouble hearing it in the club, but do it in Mike Dean's room. And then I usually switch back over to the club. Then there's the translation room. So I, I sort of mentioned, you know, with the with the car, I'm really listening to the connectivity between the upper mids and the, the bass, making sure that low mids still holds up. Uh, you know, checking the top end and the imaging a little bit. Uh, cell phone, just making sure nothing gets too harsh. And the club, which is one of my favorite spaces, actually, is to make sure that everything that sounded good in a tight space doesn't suddenly fall apart in a live one. Amazing, man. I really appreciate that answer. And I think just to kind of lean into what you talked about and kind of dissect it even more, um, if we talk about certain instrumentation, so uh, what's the best room you feel to start balancing your drums and vocals? I know you made some references to the club, but can you kind of elaborate on that as well? Yeah, so it de <laughs> it a little bit depends. As it, If you're using VSX kind of as a newer user, I would say just stick to the room that you're most comfortable with for getting balance between drums and balance between drums and vocal. If you're a little bit more experienced with VSX, I actually really like the Archon room if I'm doing a drum kit where everything is meant to be kind of one drum sound, so like a break or something like that. I actually like the Archon room for that because there's something about the bounce of the low end where like I know if it's really, really bouncing and I'm really really into it, then it's going to really work out. But then I typically will switch back over to Steven's mix room so that I can get that overall drum sound to then balance with the vocal the way that I like to hear it. Amazing, amazing, Matt. That is su super amazing. And I also want to ask you a question that's not necessarily VSX related, but uh, how do you get a, a loud, thick, and wide vocal within a mix? And like I said, I know it's not specific to VSX, but we're really curious about that. And I know you walked through a couple of different things on the elements you're working on today. Um, just wanted to pitch that for a little bit more depth. Okay, so a loud, thick. What, what was what was the list? Loud, thick, wide vocal that really has a strong presence. Loud, wick, loud, thick, wide vocal <laughs> with a strong presence. Okay, so it actually does relate to VSX because when if I'm I, I used to travel and mix in headphones, but my big problem with mixing in headphones was that the imaging was always way too wide to get a sense of where things should sound. When I'm mixing on, on a system, it forces me to move things wider and make bolder choices. VSX as a headphone system allows me to do the same thing. So I, when I want to get wide sounds, I use speakers that are set in front of me not headphone emulations that are set to the side. This way I end up exaggerating things a little bit and that ends up being the best. In terms of vocals in particular, the best way to get a wide vocal sound and a thick vocal sound is with really, really carefully done doubles. Uh, using some kind of uh, pitch 
editing type of program, time editing type of program to really edit those double tracks really, really insanely tightly and then panning them out is really the best way to get a wide vocal. Otherwise, acknowledging that a vocal is not a wide sound, you only have one mouth, that is an important part of that too. You don't always need a wide vocal if you want to, s to spread it out and keep it kind of centered. A reverb or delays, like, like a fast ping pong delay, can be really, really useful for that as well. Uh, in terms of thick and present, uh, you know, I kind of feel like that was the main focus of the webinar here, which is just making sure that that balance between the nose tones and the like brightest bridge of the nose tones that are up around 2K, 3K, and the body tones, the chest tones of your larynx that are around like, you know, 200 to 500, that there's a really good proportion of those. And if you get that proportion just right, you're going to have a present and a thick vocal. Perfect, Matt. Thank you so, so, so much. And just a couple more questions that are coming in actually as you're speaking and some that have come in previously. Um, do you do any car tests to check your mix balance? You know, uh, we have somebody saying that their mix never sounds good in the car and they're really wondering if VSX would help. Man, I cannot stress this enough. VSX, if there was no other emulations in VSX besides the cars, I'd still buy it. The cars are like the greatest thing in the world because yes, I, every, every working mix engineer does the car test. I've even known there's a studio, I can't remember who did it, but they set up a playback system where they could sit in a car and it was wired to the studio so they could do the car test without actually having to turn the car on and get in there. It's, it's a really important test because so many people are listening in cars. Yes, I still listen to my mix in the car anyway because I just want to enjoy it passively, but I find that with VSX, getting that car translation is like, it's... It's, I, I don't know if I've ever actually done a revision based on what I hear on the car, my actual car, since I got VSX like five years ago. Perfect. And I have another question also infused with that, Matt, uh, really just talking about, we talked about the car and um, being able to reference there. Um, a second pathway I want to take and segue to is have you personally ever tried mixing on the go with VSX? Um, or do you still like to be in the actual studio? Can you give us a little bit of information on that? Yeah, so uh, I mix, so a lot of the times I travel when I work. Uh, I did an album while I was in Senegal. I travel back and forth from LA to Miami, to New York, to Atlanta. I, I would say probably six to 12 times a year. I I'm on the road very frequently. And that actually is why I originally fell in love with VSX and why I use it so much. I wasn't using it as my main system. When I first got it, I was using it as my travel system. But as I started getting more and more used to it, I started realizing, wait a minute, I can hook this thing up in my home system and I can work from home, do it on my main speakers, and then do all my translation checks on VSX and I won't have to worry about how it's going to sound elsewhere. Now, I do prefer to still work with speakers, not necessarily because of the sound of them, but because of the feel of it. There is still something about headphones that I don't love. I like to hear sound coming at me physically in a space. So I do tend to mix on my... <laughs> Maybe it's a. it might also be an emotional thing too, because I put a lot of effort <laughs> into getting these things to sound good. But I will also say this, I have to accommodate for the sound of my room quite a bit. Like there's massive inconsistencies, even in my very well-traded space, that VSX does make up for. And I've simply just gotten used to them, and so I can use my home system very effectively. But that translation check is really still very much a part of the flow, even at home. And I think that, that leads me to another sub question here is, you know, we talked about your travel regimen. Are there specific aspects of your work that you can really pinpoint that have improved or benefited from using VSX the most? If you can say maybe a certain skill set that you have, or maybe something that you're just able to do more efficiently, is there something you can pinpoint uh, there? Yeah, there's a couple of things that have really stepped up um, using VSX. One thing is getting consistency of low end. It's really, really hard to get a consistent low end in any space. No matter what you're putting into the acoustics, it, it's just very challenging. So being able to reference the low end, not only in my actual room, but also on like the club and Mike Dean's room, I find that when I start hearing it in the real, real world, so to speak, and when... I start sending it out to clients, I don't get notes back on the low end nearly as often, which is great. Uh, aside from that, 
I have very bright speakers. And so checking what I did with the energy room, checking those brighter tones and the cell phone also helps me manage that presence range quite a bit. Uh, and then with the car on top of that, it all sums up to one thing, which I, is so important to me, and that is less revisions. Less revisions. The sound is a lot more predictable. I know exactly what's being sent out. So the revision process has become really emotionally a much better experience <laughs> because I don't have to worry about people hearing crazy stuff. The conversation is always a very artistically oriented one. More reverb on the vocal. Can you give it more flanging color? Like more like production sound design kind of decisions. And I, I cannot possibly put into words how nice that is. <laughs> Amazing, Matt. Um, I have another question coming in from one of the viewers. Uh, they're saying that they just got VSX and people are saying that they should listen to reference mixes. Um, and they're asking you, can you talk about the value of reference mixing, reference mixes, I'm sorry, and why they're important because they don't really quite get it. That is a really, really good question. And this is one of the toughest things about VSX when you first get it. It does take a little bit of acclimation uh, just because you're hearing so differently and because all of our ears are a little different. So I think with references, the idea is to be very much familiar with the sound of a record. I remember when I was with Steven uh, first using the beta VSXs, I was only listening to records I had mixed that I, ha I was extremely familiar with the sound of. So it's not just about it being a reference. It's about it being something where you know that record inside and out. Like, and not everybody has records like that, so you do need to develop them a little bit. So think, find things that you really enjoy. Find things that you just people generally agree are sonically really good, um, but use your own discretion. And then once you're getting used to the sound of it, that's when this ear profile stuff comes in. I, I find that average works for me, but... I can't speak to whether or not that's going to be the same for you or anyone else. That just comes with more familiarizing, more familiarizing, more familiarizing. But the more you familiarize, the more you start to respect and understand what each room is giving you information wise. But if, it, if it's throwing you off a little bit at first, that's like totally normal. Thank you, Matt, for just, again, being a wealth of knowledge. We have, we have so much, so much engagement, so much questions coming in. Uh, another one, uh, someone came in is, uh, which room do you suggest for focusing on low mids around 200 to 400 hertz? It's Steven's room. Perfect. Easy. Easy on the money. Um, and the question, secondary question from there, um, do you try to find a virtual room that makes your mix sound bad so you can correct any problems? Is that your approach? Uh, that comes in later. Yeah, that's what the translation rooms, I call them the translation rooms, the club, the cars, the cell phones, they sound bad on purpose. Uh, because what they're going to do is they're going to expose any kind of intolerable badnesses. Y you know, everything's going to sound kind of bad on a cell phone. There's it, it, Cell phones don't sound good, period. Uh, if it sounds good on the cell phone, it's probably going to sound really weird other places. But if there's something that sounds horrible on the cell phone that's when you start to adjust it. Uh, generally speaking, I prefer a room that's going to sound very neutral. That's what appeals to me. I don't want a room that's going to give me extra love. I don't want a room that's going to naturally make things a little bit grimier or, or not quite as good as they normally would be. So again, that's kind of why I'm partial to Steven's mix room. It just settles in my ear right. Thank you for that, Matt. Um, another question coming in, uh, what's your go-to chain for your mix bus uh, from EQ, compression, et cetera? Can you kind of walk through that as well? So I'm going to give you a, a bad answer to that one. I don't really have exactly a go-to chain. Um, I try as much as possible to react to what I'm hearing. In addition to that, because a lot of the records I do now have to get committed and printed for Atmos, Mixbus stuff tends to make the Atmos engineer's job a little bit harder. So it's not like I'm necessarily avoiding the, mis the Mixbus. It's more just that I'm not prioritizing it as much. There are certain things that I will tend to use, though. Uh, I do use the Eosis Air EQ quite a bit. That's like my transparent tone shift kind of EQ. Um, sometimes I use the Acoustica Straw as like a color EQ for like top uh, top end, bottom end, or or the other Acoustica One Pearl 2 uh, for like more colorful EQ. Compression wise, I typically tend to find myself liking either the Plugin Alliance um, Townhouse 
uh, SSL thing, or I actually have a DBX 160 SL, which a lot of engineers seem to like not care for or whatever it is, but I think it's a great compressor. It sounds really good. And I use it on my mix bus. It's, that's, that's a hardware piece, but I use it on my mix bus pretty often and like it quite a bit. But there, it's not like any of that stuff just goes onto the mix bus. I make that decision as I decide that decision needs to be made. And I think that's very pivotal because making a decision kind of depending on the circumstance uh, also leads to another question we have. Um, do you approach mixing vocals differently when it's a rap record similar to what you showed today versus a singing record? Um, I kind of want to get into that as well as a question that came in. Okay, so this is a really good question on two levels. First of all, yes, just because physically speaking, there's a different mechanism that goes into rap than what goes into singing. Uh, there's more percussive energy, the words tend to come by faster, and all of that requires a slightly nuanced technical approach. But more importantly, there are cultural differences. Music is not the expression of organized sound. That is a terrible definition. Music is the cultural expression of sound. It's sound that means something to people. So it, it's completely untrue that if you can mix one genre, you can mix another. No. You can do maybe an okay parody, but you have to understand who you're mixing for. So that leads me to think of ambience very differently. If I'm doing a rap record, I tend to err on the side of drier. Whereas when I'm doing records that are more like, you know, maybe pop records, I tend to pretty much very rarely ever put them dry. Uh, and every different style of music, whether it's Afro or uh, Latin or different genres within Latin, different genres within pop, rock, jazz, all of that it leads to a different approach in terms of the sound design and aesthetic that I reach for, which is really, really important. And I think what's what's uh, looking at tonight's example, Matt, and uh, I know we you know heavily featured hip hop record, um, and and talking about the different artifacts you just mentioned, uh, would you use the same choice of the rooms you use for mixing rock or metal? I mean, when I say that, would it be circumstantial as you talked about before or would you go through the same gambit and routine you kind of have when you first pop up in a mix or what would that look like uh, i don't think i would switch rooms dependent on genre because the rooms are going to give me a technical image of sound the choices i make will switch because of well, really not even just because of genre, but be really because of what I think the music is expressing. Now, certain genres do tend to lend themselves towards sonic differences. So, for example, if you're doing like a 90s inspired kind of, you know, CLA rock type of record, you know, Green Day or whatever it might be, a lot of the energy gets concentrated into the upper mids. And so for that, I might maybe use the energy room a little bit more because if there's problems, it's going to become more apparent to me. But I think that my ear would lead me in that direction anyway. And it's more about what's really there than what the genre exactly is, if that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. And you said something very important at the very end of that. You talked about letting your ear lead you. And there's actually a question that came in from someone asking how do they determine which ear profile to use when they first set up their VSX? Did you kind of walk through that process when you first jumped into the world of VSX and you had to set up yours? Yeah, so all of these um, different things, actually, I'll talk about all of this stuff, actually, the ear profile and the depth, um, and also the new HRTF thing that's going on in the Yellow Matter studio. So. I think these things are subjective, which makes it a little difficult to nail what you're trying to do exactly. But it, it comes down to, this is why familiarization is really important. Um, you know, I find that when I switch my ear profile either to one or to two, something doesn't sound right. Usually the mid range starts to get weird, but in a very subtle way, it's not like it would throw me off horribly to be mixing on different ear profiles. So I just keep it at average. And that seems to be working for me. When I take VSX off and I play it through my regular speakers or when I go to the car, I'm getting the results and it's translating. So that tells me that the average ear profile is working. If there was a translation issue, then I might like reassess that and see what else is going on. And the same thing kind of applies to like the depth. The depth I do find is a little bit more room dependent and certain rooms it seems like, like with the clubs, anything that's really like space dependent where it's not like an acoustically treated tight type of space tends to benefit from more having the depth toward the full or the depth on full for me might not be the case for you. Uh, but for rooms that are tighter sounding, so like specifically, uh, 
uh, Stephen's room, for example, I find that that benefits from being at a little bit of a lower depth. Now, it's interesting with the Yellow Matter one, I found that to be exactly the opposite. Like, uh, the full depth sounds fantastic here, and I don't know why. I don't know what it is that does that, but th it seems like different depths in different rooms seem to make a bit of a difference for me. Uh, and the same thing with its HRTF. I haven't quite decided what I like about it. B feels like hyper-realistic in a way that's almost d disorienting. Uh, so A is where my comfort zone is at, and I don't know how to decide what I prefer quite yet. But as I familiarize myself with it more, I'm sure I will. Sorry, that was a very long-winded answer, but I, I wanted to be thorough about that. No, Matt, you're fine. The, the people are interested in what you have to say, so we, we really appreciate it. Um, do you exclusively use VSX for mixing, or do you track with it as well? I exclusively use VSX for mixing. Uh, and the reason is not because you can't use VSX for tracking. It's because I'm scared to death of every tracking space that I use because I know that one wrong move in Pro Tools is going to absolutely crap its pants. So the less stuff that I have going on, the simpler the tracking setup digitally that I've got, the, the better I'm going to feel. It's why I still track at 44.1 very frequently. But that's me, and that's me being like old geezer that is like scared of software. So I don't know if I would take my word for it on that one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. And then um, do you always check your vocal first when mixing on VSX? Uh, I know we, we you kind of showed us a little bit that in the really beginning of the live stream, but just wanted to bring that up as a question that came in. So, no, I don't. I, I don't think when I'm starting a mix for me, I really try to center myself on what the record is. I try. I mean, it sounds like some hippie stuff, but I really try to center myself on the emotional energy of the record as much as possible. And then whatever inspires me to work, which might be something that has the most problems, but could also just be like one element that just has the most personality. I tend to start with that. There's a lot of different ways people will start mixes. Some people always start from vocals. Some people always start from drums and bass. Some people always start from the low end some people start in a way that's called top down where they do faders with whatever kind of mix bus stuff they have there's nothing wrong with any of these techniques you have to go with what works for you i happen to be a big fan of just letting the record speak to me and then gravitating toward what's speaking to me in the moment perfect really good to hear matt um and then i know we're focused on primarily mixing right now but do you use vsx in your mastering process uh, and if so, do you check it in different virtual rooms when you're mastering? Can you kind of walk us through that process? I have not mastered a record without VSX since the moment I got VSX. Because the main thing about mastering a record is translation. That is the absolute pinnacle of a good master, or at least the starting point of a good master. So VSX for mastering is like, it's probably the easiest slam dunk decision, in my opinion. But yeah, no, I... I I've mixed records without VSX, but I don't think I've ever mastered a record without VSX since like 2017. That is a quote of the year. We need to put that on a flyer. We really, really appreciate that. And, and that's just a testament of the so, you know, versatility so, of VSX. So Slate Audio, my PayPal is... No, I'm just playing. <laughs> uh, so you talked about references and reference tracks earlier. Uh, do you have a favorite reference that you could recommend to a, a new hip hop producer that they can utilize? Ooh, that's a tough one. But, you know, this is this is the thing, and this is actually this is where teaching can sometimes get tough too. Is that I've become very familiar with the sound that I like, so I reference to my own ear. Um, a hip hop record in the year of our Lord Beyonce, twenty twenty three. I don't know. Most of the records that I reference for hip hop go way back, like like Pharaoh Monch records and like like uh, 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 early J like like Black Al um, the Black Album from Jay Z and like this stuff that's like early two thousands because I feel like hip hop really hit a certain special point between about nineteen ninety five and like two thousand five. That kind of ten year gap was like just a really special maybe even a little earlier for the purists, but a very special point for hip hop specifically. Um, some of the like 2010s Kanye West stuff is really, really good and maybe more applicable to 2023. Uh, yeah, I'm drawing blanks. I, I feel like I haven't really referenced a modern hip hop record in a long time. Well, I feel you gave us some good, I feel, I feel you gave us some good insight from Kanye to some early Jay-Z as well. 
um, and some of those early 2000s hip hop records. I think that's a, a good testament for people to start, I guess, from a time frame perspective. I know, but I'm just, I feel like I'm boom, like going into super boomer room, boomer mode when I'm like, oh, dear, today's hip hop doesn't sound as good as it used to. Oh. <laughs> uh, no, it's all good. Um, another question I want to ask you, it's kind of a two part question. So um, the first part would be, uh, have you spent much time mixing in the two new rooms in VSX, the Yellow Matter studio, Studios and Club Indie, and what do you think of them so far? Uh, I haven't spent a lot of time mixing in them, but I think that I will start gravitating over toward Yellow Matter because there's a sense of detail there that is really kind of unprecedented, and I, I love that. It doesn't feel quite as flat as Steven's room, but it, it feels very, very detailed, and I think that's really cool. And the sense of space is, like, weirdly realistic, which I don't know how important that necessarily is, but I, I'm interested to see where it goes, so I'm going to try it for sure. The other club room, uh, what the heck is it called? It's called Indie Club or something like that? Club Indie. Indie. Yeah, Club Indie, yeah. So that, to me, is kind of like a fancy, nice version of the club. The original club kind of sounds like a big, doofy warehouse, which is where a lot of the music we make is going to play back, which is why I like it. So this is big, doofy warehouse. The Club Indie feels like it's more like a live stage area that was put together for a concert experience. And I think it's amazing that we have that as well, I just, I don't know where I'm going to go with it quite yet because I've literally only used it, I think, for like two days, something like that. No, and that, and that's like, that leads perfectly into the next part I want to ask you is how often do you stray outside of your favorite rooms? Um, what's your regiment there? When do you pop open a space you might not be super familiar with or you don't usually use? Um, or do you always stick with the favorite ones on every mix? I tend to stick with my favorite ones. I, I tend to kind of go through the process I was just going through here, and that tends to be with Steven's room now that, you know, but that's a, actually sort of a more recent room in many regards. So I started on Archon, and I got really familiar with that sound. I still go back to that sometimes, and the times that I go back to the Archon room is when I feel like I need to enjoy the record more just to get started. I'm, I'm a very emotional mixer of... Not like I'm like like mood swinging while I'm mixing, but like you know, I I dance around, I move around, I like have emotional responses. I'll well up if like basically I never want anybody to ever see me really mixing a record and actually watching what I do because it would be way too embarrassing. But if I need an emotional boost on a record, I'll still go back to the Archon room. But I would say that's maybe only about twenty percent of the time these days. And then coupled with that, I think if we switch over from a mixing aspect back to the mastering aspect, um, are you using the same rooms you showed us as when you're mixing for your mastering process? Or is there maybe a best room for mastering that you believe that is like, OK, this is the room I like to look at and reference whenever I'm going through the mastering process? Yeah. So the two that I use for the mastering process the most are Mike Dean's and Howie's room. Uh, now that that Howie's room is, is sounding like really good. And, uh, and since I don't use Mike Dean's room that much when I'm mixing, uh, I feel like for mastering, it's really good because it presents me with new information. The thing that's tough about mastering, I should qualify that and say that's a record that I myself mixed. So if I mixed it, that's what I tend to do. And the reason is because it gives me a fresh perspective and perspective is the hardest thing to get when you're mastering something that you also mixed. Inherently, if you did the mix perfectly, there's nothing you would change in the master. So you need to switch your perspective. So that's not only just using different rooms, it's also stepping away from the record a little bit. Maybe take a day, take a couple days so that you kind of forget the sound of the record and then come back to it and use one of those new rooms and you get a fresh perspective and you could go, oh, okay, this was off, this is off, cool, this little tweak, one dB here, half a dB here, boom, bang, perfect. Uh, when I'm mastering records that I didn't mix, which I'm doing more often, weirdly enough, uh, then I tend to kind of go through more of like my own mix process approach where I'm checking the translation and things like that because that's stuff that I normally compensate for in the mix, but I don't get the chance to do when I, well, didn't do the mix. So there's more of that stuff involved when I'm mastering somebody else's mix. I hope I explained that well. 
Beautifully, beautifully, Matt. And I, I just wanted to wrap up with one last question for you, um, getting towards the end of our Q&A session. So uh, this is uh, a good producer question. So what headphone amp do you use? And do you think it matters for producers to invest in separate headphone apps versus just plugging into their computer directly? I don't know if you have any insight for um, one of our viewers that is asking about this. Yeah, I do actually. So I've found that even plugging into a laptop, which has probably the worst amp system and conversion out of anything, but just plugging straight in using VSX, I can still get pretty predictable results. Like I feel like there's not really too much compromise at all until you get to the very, very, very upper frequencies. That's the only place it gets a little dodgy. But outside of that, even just using the regular old, I'm plugging straight into a computer, straight into the laptop, I find VSX to be really, really good and really, really reliable. So I know that if I'm mixing something on the road and I happen to come back home, when I plug in VSX, it's going to sound exactly the same, which is really, really good. And then maybe I can fix whatever's going on at 15K, you know, um, do I think the headphone amps make a small difference? Yes, I use the headphone amp that's built into my Lynx Aurora N. Uh, fantastic sounding and no complaints there. So, yeah, but I, I would say it's not the most necessary expense. Probably one of the least, to be honest. Thank you for that, Matt. Um, and again, Matt, thank you for your time and thank you for sharing all your insights with us. Before we wrap up, do you have any last words, final thoughts you would like to share with the viewers? Yeah, um, you know, I, I appreciate everybody tuning in, uh, being patient with the previous technical difficulties that we have. We got it on track, and I'm really happy that I was able to present this. Uh, I uh, hopefully will be able to do this more in the future. We actually did it once about six months ago, and, and it worked out pretty nicely. So, you know, I just, I hope I get a chance to share my techniques and tips with you more. If you're not familiar with my YouTube channel, check out Weiss Advice. Um, it rhymes, therefore it must be good. But yeah, I have that YouTube channel and it's it's very technique heavy. A lot of good information there. So I guess those are pretty much my only final thoughts. I'm sure I'll think of something later. <laughs> well, th well, again, Matt, again, thank you for your time. And I also want to thank everyone else for joining. Um, we'll be sending out a link to this video to rewatch for anyone that joined late or may not have been able to stay the whole time. And also, just want to let everybody know one of the things that Sagar talked about early on is we have our VSX Platinum sale going on to the end of the year, where it's $100 off on our VSX Platinum uh, for the VSX mix mixing system, which is very exciting. And you know, it's only while supplies last or until the end of the year. Okay.